pleasure to uh, edit the name uh, uh, that you, as your real name uh, or organization. Uh, but we're happy to have you here um, uh, in either case. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us uh, in person or online at the uh, for our event at the 66th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Thank you to our co-sponsoring NGOs and especially um, Leonardo Fiorentini of Forum Droga for uh, valuable assistance uh, once again this year. Uh, and a uh, special <coughs> greeting to uh, our guests from the um, uh, local Filipino community here in, in Vienna. Uh, my name is David Borden. I am the founder and executive director of DRCNet Foundation, also known as StopTheDrugWar.org. Uh, this is the 15th in a series of forums we have held at UN and other international uh, uh, meetings that uh, either in whole or in part have uh, dealt with uh, extrajudicial killings in the Philippine drug war uh, as uh, begun under uh, now former President uh, Rodrigo Duterte. Uh, our first took place uh, six years ago uh, here at the CND. Uh, three weeks prior to that, uh, Senator Lila de Lima uh, was jailed in the Philippines following her having uh, facilitated the exposing of extremely damaging information about uh, the Duterte drug war in the Val City uh, during his time as mayor. Uh, six years later, the now former senator uh, remains in Camp Prame despite no convictions having been gained against her and the recantations of several of the key witnesses uh, who have stated they um, uh, provided false information under pressure from the government. Uh, so while our first thoughts are with uh, those who have been killed, uh, according to NGO estimates uh, on the order of 30,000 in, uh, in, uh, in the Duterte drug war, uh, but if only according to the government estimates, somewhere between six and 7,000, uh, we also uh, keep in mind those who have faced retaliation uh, for trying to help. Uh, one of those people is uh, a speaker here today, um, and please that uh, Father Albert uh, Alejo, an uh, uh, extremely important human rights campaigner uh, from the uh, Philippines, uh, who is now a uh, faculty at uh, Pontifical Gregorian University uh, in Rome. Uh, so Father Albert, uh, uh, you have the floor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Leonardo. Thank you, David, for in sorry. thank you, David, for inviting me, and thank you for those who are attending here in person and uh, online. So again, I'm Father Albert Alejo. Just call me Marine Bird. So this is about fractures. Okay. <clears throat> um, just I just have some pre notes. One is I honestly, honestly acknowledge that the new National Administration of the Philippine Government under Ferdinand Marcos Jr. promises to be different from the massive human rights violations inflicted by the previous administration under the leadership of uh, President uh, Duterte. A second pre note. <clears throat> I'm, also, I'm also appreciative of the reorientation that uh, Marcos uh, gave to government uh, personnel in approaching the substance abuse, <laughs> which includes community-based and health-oriented programs that also integrates the participation of civil society. I acknowledge that, yes. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, killings continue, and those who have been killed, they're not brought to life. You know. And the uh, promises for reform I think, <clears throat> I believe, I assert, I insist, must not be used as alibi for not exacting accountability and injustice for past and present surplus of brutality, all in the name of the war on drugs. We cannot say, because there is reform, let's forget about the past. Okay? Next. <clears throat> and fourth, I believe the international solidarity translated as international pressure can help in the local trial for justice and sanity in the Philippines and elsewhere. 
So I pick up from the Vienna Declaration 30 years ago. Human rights and fundamental freedoms are the birthright right of all human beings, and their protection and promotion is the first responsibility of government. On that note, when we say we are building a world that is protective of human rights and dignity, the opposite of this thing fractures society. All this fractured, broken, and broken into pieces, when in the name of fighting drug syndicates, we end up killing their victims and jailing their defenders. And sadly, that is the case in the Philippines, whether you could be with it or not. Next. Next. <clears throat> so killings fracture society. The principle of respect for the universal human rights and human dignity is mocked when somewhere in the world, in the name of the war on drugs, an average of 1,000 persons are killed in the first seven months of the new of the the third administration, followed by more than brut, more than uh, more brutal killings thereafter, and we estimate about 30,000. So that multiplies into families and neighborhoods grieving over their lost loved ones. And right now, Father Flavi is still exhuming some of the bones and ashes. That is the case of the Philippines now under the investigation uh, of the International Criminal Court. Next. Next. So, whew, the first six months, this, this is officially documented. We have an average of 1,000 killings a month, whereas the martial law uh, record of Marcos before had 320 killings, unexplained killings in one year. The Duterte administration had an average of 1,000, or a little less than 1,000 a month for the first seven months that were fully, uh, officially recorded. Next. I don't want to show images that are so bloody. Now, the other thing is, in the inhospitality to the ICC against, is against international cooperation. So what else fractures society? Now, there is this international support through the International Criminal Court. When you don't allow the investigation, you're hiding something. Okay, next. <clears throat> a very short time. So, the, uh, you know, uh, the building um, human rights, uh, a world with human rights and human dignity rests on truth. Because this principle of human rights rests on rational affirmation of the truth about human beings. But when you declare somebody as subhuman or inhuman just because they use drugs, they become addicts, addicts become criminals, and as criminals they are less than human and therefore they can be killed, that kind of slippage of meanings attached to the discourse of uh, violence is an attack on truth and it is translated into an attack on truth-tellers. And we, that includes even those who admit to being part of the killings before. They had spiritual uh, conversion, and now they're saying, the Dato Death Squad, the Death Squad is, is true, and I was part of it. And uh, we need to, to listen to them rather than attack them. Next. Now, uh, one very poignant uh, symbol of what is still wrong, despite the reforms, what is still wrong in the name of human drugs, uh, of uh, war on drugs, is the continued imprisonment of Senator Laila de Lima. I have had the fortune of meeting her when she was investigating the human rights violations in Davao City way back when... Uh, I was assigned in, in Davao City. And then uh, we worked together in exposing the violations of, against human rights uh, according to culprits, according to the killers, who we managed, especially through Laila de Lima, to have a platform at the Senate hearing on TV. But the problem was some senators blocked the continuation of the storytelling and instead sent Senator Laila de Lima in prison. I used to say mass together with other priests, Father Robert Reyes and Father uh, Flavio Villanueva inside the custodial uh, prison. Next. 
And so, so what's our call? Um, number one, um, it's quite important to have documentation so that uh, we don't rely on hearsay or false news or fake news. So there are people who are documenting the violations of human rights. Let's support them. Let's encourage further research and analysis and, pr and projection of the results of these uh, researches. It is extremely important. Next. Uh, we need to support the call, the international pressure on the present government to allow the entry of the investigators of the International Criminal Court. This is very important because some other stories are not, have not yet emerged. And so it's important to also double check the claims of people like us in the civil society. So it's important to get to the truth next. And of course, uh, if this administration, the new administration, is really sincere, and there are no, uh, there are no evidence, and uh, witnesses have retracted their accusations, and six judges have, in different ways, inhibited themselves. No one wants to make a decision. Now, withdraw the case. Please, free Senator Laila de Lima. Next. Because the major test uh, accusers have confessed that they were just pressured. Next. It's... It, <laughs> It's, uh, the accusations on illegal drug charges simply has no basis. Next. It, this is next. This is curious because this is a case on illegal drugs when they cannot even identify what, what drugs were, were uh, transacted. Is it shabu or is it what? And there's no single gram of, of uh, evidence. Next. So imagine, um, I'm presenting this not to read, but uh, for the sake of record, so that you can re review that. Next. There's no evidence in terms of actual drugs. There's no evidence in, of conspiracy, because the people who are supposed to have been part of the conspiracy, said they were not drug lords. <laughs> they did not know anything. <laughs> they did not know Laila de Lima. They had no uh, contact with them. And if, even if they said so previously, now they are retracted. Next. And even the, the government uh, agencies, the AMLA, the Bureau of uh, Customs, the, the, the bank system, the Bureau the Commission on Audit, they all said, this is government agencies. We cannot find anything irregular in the accounts of Laila de Lima. So what's the past next? <clears throat> and so actually we can have a, a, an acronym here. No? no evidence versus Laila de Lima. Drug evidence, lies, innocence, money, attempt to silence the critic. Next. <clears throat> and so we call on, the, again, free Laila de Lima. Next. Now, we call also, not just the government, but civil society. Uh, we have our own faults, including the religious sector, including the church where I belong. We have our own scandals. But just because we have our own faults or scandals, we should not be stymied to speak out. We must find a way. We, we must find the words and the discourse of uh, telling the truth and demanding integrity and exposing lies, even if the process would boomerang on us. And I think we all need to, to learn how to do that. It's a, it's a wounded discourse of an embarrassed prophet. <laughs> but still, we need to speak out, even if it boomerangs on us. Next. And a call on all the Filipinos, fellow Filipinos. Now, we can say we cannot do everything, of course. But the, the minimum is, let's listen to the victims. We don't have all the solutions yet, but at least listen to their cries. And don't reduce them to statistics. Look at the eyes. Listen to their stories. And feel the pain. Even if you don't have solution yet. 
But don't hide the pain. Because this fractures our society and destroys our desire, the noble desire to have truth in the service of human dignity, which is the foundation of the United Nations. Next. So maybe I can end with a quotation from Pope Francis Fratelli Tutti, because he's my boss now in Rome. <laughs> he says in Fratelli Tutti, human rights are not equally observed in all. Many forms of injustice persist, fed by a profit-based economic model that does not hesitate to exploit, discard, and even kill human beings. He preaches about throwaway culture, but this throwaway culture throws not just garbage, but also lifeless bodies of victims. Let's do something. Thank you very much. speaker uh, is uh, Muhammad Ashraf Saman, known to friends as Saman, uh, uh, from the uh, Asian uh, Human Rights Center and Asian Legal Resource uh, Center. He's a native Bangladeshi, and he will tell us about the um, uh, the drug war and extrajudicial killings and related, mat related matters uh, in uh, his native country. Uh, uh, um, thank, you. thank you very much. Am I loud enough? I hope. Okay. Thank you very much. So thanks to StopTheDragWar.org uh, uh, for hosting this event and having us here. And thanks to all of you who have taken the trouble to come here and uh, join us. The uh, uh, Briefly, the overall uh, what I'm going to talk about is, of course, we, many of us, or all of us in this room or who have joined online, uh, we have serious concerns about the drug that is uh, uh, also destroying many societies in the world, uh, many uh, young generations, and at the same time, uh, uh, there are many root causes that are not being addressed in, in the countries that have been facing the challenges of the spread of drug and the institutional issues that are involved in it. So that's basically uh, I'm going to talk about. So, I mean, uh, if you look at Bangladesh, it has, uh, it, it is the incumbent member of the CND, uh, the Commission of Narcotics uh, Drug uh, here. And uh, they may be, when you go to the room upstairs during the sessions, uh, you may be listening amazing things from them, uh, which may not always uh, sound the same, what I'm going to talk about. But what I would say is what I hear from the victims and my colleagues, human rights defenders, based in within the country. Uh, I'm in exile. Uh, I cannot go to the country for uh, over a decade. So, uh, I mean, but I have lots of uh, eyes and ears active on the ground. So, I mean, uh, let's talk a little, a little bit about that. The country has death penalty for drug. Uh, right, there is a drug called Yaba, uh, locally known. It's a combination of, uh, uh, the English name is... Uh, methamphetamine and caffeine, so it's a mixture. Together, this uh, tablet is made. Uh, Leo may have a photo, uh, maybe in, in, in a minute you will see this. Uh, so, this, apart from all other drugs, there are many other kinds of drugs that is coming from, yeah, the, this is one. I mean, if, if the color looks beautiful, but the impact is the deadly. So, uh, this uh, is a top of the, I mean, list in the, in the country at the moment. And the government has in its recent amendment to the uh, law in 2018, they have added death penalty of five grams of it if anybody produces, possesses, or smuggles 
So that would be enough to fail, have a penalty for this. Now, the question is this drug comes from mostly uh, popularly known as uh, from young, uh, Burma, uh, Myanmar. And uh, the reason that world uh, hardly knows that who are involved uh, behind trading this. So the person who is known, uh, famous in, in Bangladesh, to be the godfather of drug, he happened to be a member of the ruling party parliament, a member of parliament from the ruling party, till uh, 2018. And in the 2018 election, it was not an election, I will come to that point later. So uh, he was not eligible to be a candidate. So the ruling party picked up his wife to become the member of parliament. And this gentleman, he, he is from Cox's Bazaar, where all these Rohingya refugees the, who fled the genocidal crime from their home and now uh, accommodated in the Chevy uh, refugee camps in, in Bangladesh in the Cox's Bazaar district, uh, uh, SI, I mean along the Bay of Bengal. And that is the main person who controls and collaborates with the law enforcement agencies, all the, the border guards, and everyone else to trade it, bring it to the country and supply it in the market. The entire chain, uh, I mean, he's under his control and associated by the people from the law enforcement agencies, the ruling party, and that. And without assistance, it, it's, it cannot be done. So now, when you, in one hand, you see the, the government that adopts law to uh, kill people from the judicial, I mean, through judicial proceedings, uh, whether credible or not, that's a different question. And then, there is also extrajudicial killings for uh, drug. So, hundreds of people have been killed extrajudicially uh, for allegedly carrying or trading drug. And many of them are also the Rohingya refugees who are used by this ruling party, uh, the godfather and his team, uh, in a kind of helpless situation because uh, everything is under control, under the surveillance of the agencies. And uh, when they are tempted to do this with a little bit of money, and these people are not allowed. It's not a refugee in Europe. Here, a refugee in places they are uh, eligible to work to some extent. But the Rohingya refugees, they are almost like in confinement within the uh, the bob, uh, boundary of the camps. They are expected to stay, and they are not supposed to come out of that jurisdiction, the, uh, the uh, boundary. So these people are used and others as well. I mean, it's not limited to the Rohingya, the native Bangladeshi people uh, who are part of this uh, trade. So they are involved in that. And you can understand, since this uh, Rohingya exodus has come to Bangladesh in August 2017, the kind of security arrangement is made in the government has deployed the armed police battalion in Cox's Bazaar, and uh, more numbers of other security forces like the border guards, the rapid action battalion, the armed forces itself, uh, the navy, uh, the coast guard. So all these agencies are in the Naf River, which has uh, which shares the border with Burma and Bangladesh, and then the Chittagong Hill Tracks area, which is uh, has high military presence. So. How these, uh, we have to ask this question that how it comes to uh, crossing across the border and then it's, uh, it's spread in the other 1000 kilometers or 800, 700 kilometers of different, I mean, corners of the country without the uh, collaboration of the uh, law enforcement agencies. So the two kinds of, I mean, uh, Execution, one, judiciary, you have the law, 
to, I mean, kill people, I mean, uh, I mean pronounce uh, punishment, death penalty, capital punishment, and you have the extrajudicial killing. The number has recently been a little less than before uh, uh, as an impact. One of the impacts of the sanction designated by United States Treasury Department against Rapid Action Battalion, which is known to be the state's death squad, in human rights watch exactly use this term, the death squad of Bangladesh. So, and six of its top commanders, uh, incumbent and former commanders, they were sanctioned and two of them also got visa banned by the United States Treasury, uh, it is Department of State. So, now the thing is, we need to see the bigger picture here. The bigger picture is, when this kind of situation happens, like a government has a very clear double standard, it is, uh, of course, death penalty is, is against human rights, very simple. And so you cannot have it. Father has already said, life cannot be brought back. So uh, we all know that, I'm not going into that details. So first of all, death penalty should not be there, but then to control your drug, you need very transparent and effective policy. And that is where the problem is. The law enforcement agencies of the country they don't comply with the international guidelines for using firearms or, I mean, uh, lethal force. So that in, in Bangladesh, it's uh, unimaginable. And uh, the extrajudicial killings, for example, under this government itself is about 2,700, the, the documented one. There are also undocumented cases. You may find bodies. Somebody was picked up from maybe imagine the northern part of the country and the body was found in, in, in the south or the eastern part or somewhere else in the middle. So then the poor people, the families cannot travel all the way to few hundred kilometers to identify the body. So they, they, they go, I mean, it's not possible to 100% ascertain that, okay, the agencies are involved but we have seen a very high number of unidentified bodies being found and these uh, 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 humanitarian organizations are engaged to uh, organize the funerals because nobody is there to claim those bodies. And the forensic investigation and other kind of facilities is not uh, uh, up to the mark so that it could be detected that if the person is uh, from such and such address. Or from such and such families. So, in that context, the uh, why it it happens because the government doesn't have any form of accountability, political in the parliament, judicial in, in the uh, in the judiciary as as a whole in the uh, justice system, and uh, anywhere else or or international. So, in that context, uh, wh when I say that they don't have political or parliamentary accountability, why I say that is the last two elections in 2014 and 2018, they were rigged. The 2014 one, all opposition parties boycotted, so the ruling party was declared the winner with uh, more than half of their candidates uh, own and opposed. There are no candidates to contest against them. So out of 300, 153, they got oh, elected before the, I mean, election started, or the single vote uh, was cast. And then the remaining ones, around 5% turnout, mostly the ruling party people or their relatives, but the election commission, they, they manufactured a, a distorted report of, of turnout, which is much higher than uh, the original. The 2018 election, uh, that happened in uh, 30th December, scheduled to happen, but the government, the election commission, law enforcement agencies and the ruling party, very efficiently, they completed the election 
before the boating hour started on the previous night. And uh, 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 how it is possible? If you check BBC or I can, anybody wants, I can share it and uh, we can show it in here. BBC journalist was in the Chittagong, one of the port cities uh, in Bangladesh, wired at a polling center. And then the journalist found that ballot boxes filled up with staffed ballot were being carried from one floor to another. And a short video that BBC published and also photographed. And the journalists also recorded the time, which is before 8 o'clock, the voting was officially supposed to begin. Then, Amnesty Interna uh, uh, Transparency International, they made a survey across the country. And then they found out of 50 constituencies, I mean, they were able to do in 50 constituencies out of 300. So they found 47 out of 50, the voting was done on the previous night. So that's how the right to franchise in Bangladesh. And if you have followed the newspaper of the country two days ago, the Supreme Court bar, the highest judiciary of the country, the bar association was supposed to elect its leadership. So before the election was supposed to begin, the election commissioner, the chief of, of the team, was taken by the law enforcement agencies and forced him to thank you forced him mm -hmm. to uh, I mean resign from his position and then the government I mean uh, somebody who is extremely loyal to the government was replaced uh, by him and then the police in the bar association mm -hmm. which is unprecedented in, in the in the history of Bangladesh they came, invaded the uh, bar building and beat, <coughs> beat every, I mean, uh, everybody. Lawyers, journalists, whoever was there, all the litigants. So that's how, from uh, national parliamentary election to local government, and in between all the professional bodies or any private en entities, nowhere, the electoral democratic participation is not tolerated at all. It doesn't exist. So in that context, the judiciary also doesn't function. <coughs> it's the recruitment, promotion, posting, everything is politicized. You need to imagine this because of time, uh, David uh, was reminding me. Yeah. And then uh, 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 there is no result to go for any kind of victims whether you are human rights abuse victims or any kind of political violence victims. So that also falls into the category of human rights violation, uh, organized crime. Uh, so there is no result. And that's where this uh, uh, international accountability, for example, uh, example the global Magnitsky uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, legislations regimes in different territories now, the European Union has it. Uh, UK has it, uh, uh, United States and Canada, Australia, they have it. So this may play a very effective role. And one of the first things that everybody needs to agree that any change of the human rights or any change of the drug killing or in Bangladesh, the first and foremost thing is required is credible election under a neutral government, not this government. Because this simply doesn't uh, want people to vote. And then the protection of human rights defenders who are independent and who want to document this, they are facing prosecution. Uh, right now, my colleagues uh, Adil Rahman Khan and ASM Nasiruddin Elan, the, the secretary of Odika and director of the same organization, they also documented uh, extrajudicial killings, crime committed by the law enforcement agencies and security forces back in 2013. And now they are facing cyber crime a trial. So trial is about to end in a few weeks time. So uh, if the government remains in office, so by April they will be in jail for about 10 years, 5 to 10 years to minimum for the human rights activism. So the international community, the human rights community, they need to raise their voice, do everything possible so that they don't land in jail. 
and then of course the freedom of press and freedom of uh, the civil society the protection uh, that needs to be there and uh, I would also encourage and request uh, everyone to think about the sanction regime how to best use it in the case of Bangladesh. So with that, uh, I will stop here, and if you have questions, we, I can respond to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Solomon. Our, our next speaker joins us online from um, uh, London, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, uh, Natalia Kubesh is a legal officer at the uh, UK-based NGO Redress where she focuses on the use of Magnitsky sanctions to provide accountability for serious human rights violations. Prior to her work at Redress, she practiced at two international law firms working on complex financial crime investigations and litigations and advised on compliance with the UK's sanction regimes. Uh, her pro bono and volunteer work uh, has uh, spanned a range of issues include, including help for victims of arbit arbitrary detention, and of sexual violence, of gender discrimination, and, uh, and, and uh, she's volunteered on uh, access to justice initiatives. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Natalia. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. It really is a pleasure to be speaking on this panel. Today I'll be looking at the UK's Magnitsky sanction regime and how I can provide a form of accountability for human rights violations committed in pursuance of states' global war and war policies. I'll be speaking from a UK perspective today, but many points and considerations I will discuss are also applicable to the US and US sanctions regime. Before I start, I'll quickly give you one of the points I will cover today. First, I will discuss how human rights abuses committed in the context of the global war on drugs qualify as sanctionable activities under the UK's sanction regime. Second, I will discuss the UK's current landscape of sanctions on perpetrators involved in global war on drug abuses and political considerations that potentially impact government's willingness to impose sanctions in this context. Third, I will draw on the UK's previous experience with the use of targeted sanctions on perpetrators based in countries UK consider strategic allies, including the Philippines and Bangladesh, to discuss factors that could increase the likelihood of Magnitsky sanctions. I will conclude by highlighting how sanctions submission by civil society serves an important advocacy tool for people seeking accountability for human rights abuses in the name of the global war on drug policies. Before I go on and set out the UK's Benitsky sanction regime, it's crucial to flag that the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office encourages civil society to submit dossiers of evidence on perpetrators of human rights violations and request, request for them to be sanctioned for their involvement in these abuses. It is therefore a regime that encourages and very much relies on civil society engagement and the evidence they can provide. So by way of background, the UK's Magnitsky sanction regime authorizes the imposition of asset freezes and travel bans against individuals or entities involved in certain serious human rights violations. These violations are defined as an individual's right to life, the right not to be subject to torture, cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment, and the right to be free from slavery and forced labour. War on drug policies often serve as an excuse for grossly disproportionate punishment, torture and extrajudicial killings. Moreover, the persecution, incarceration or ultimately execution of drug users exasperates poverty and leaves children vulnerable to sexual exploitation and modern slavery. Policies promoting such abuses therefore clearly qualify as sanctionable conduct. Further, under the UK regime, a person is considered to have been involved in these violations, not only if they have committed a violation, but also if they have overseen or otherwise facilitated, promoted, incited, supported, concealed, failed to investigate it, and benefited from it. This has the potential to capture a broad range of perpetrators involved in promoting war on drug policies, from police officers, army officials, judges, lawyers, journalists, doctors, and politicians, authorizing, overseeing, inciting, willfully ignoring or benefiting from the abuses. As a final step under the UK regime, the UK government must assess whether sanctions align with certain policy considerations, including UK's human rights priorities, the scale of the violations, and whether domestic accountability for violation is possible. Now, while stopping violence in the context of the global war on drug is not per se a UK government priority, 
um, state government priority. Individuals that are particularly at risk are those that report on the violence and protest against the government abuses, which squarely falls within UK human rights priorities on protection of media freedom and human rights defenders. Further, the number of deaths committed in the context of war of drug, of the, in the context of the war on drugs, for example, in the Philippines alone, is estimated at 30,000. And with that, the scale of these abuses substantially exceeds many other instances of serious human rights abuses that have resulted in sanctions by the UK government. Finally, there is a clear lack of domestic accountability. Again, in the context of the Philippines, despite thousands of deaths, only one case has resulted in a criminal conviction to date. All other implicated officers in the war on drugs have received minor disciplinary sanctions or escaped just altogether. Therefore, on the face of it, government officials involved in extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances committed as part of the global war on drug policies qualify for sanctions under the UK regime, and such sanctions would align with the UK's policy considerations. Now, having established that these um, criteria are met, let's look at figures of how many people have actually been sanctioned to date. The answer, disappointingly, is that to date, the UK has sanctioned only three Iranian judges and ministers for, among other reasons, having overseen executions for drug-related offences and condoning excessive punishments for drug offences under the Iran country sanction regime. No, no individual to date has been sanctioned under the human rights sanction regime, and no designation refers specifically to war drug policies. I'll quickly touch on two reasons why this may be the case. First, many countries implicated in human rights abuses in the guise of the war on drugs are deemed strategic allies and trading partners of the UK. Both the Philippines and Bangladesh are considered important partners for of the UK in areas of trade, investment, security and defence. This context creates significant diplomatic sensitivities impacting the UK government's willingness to impose targeted human rights sanctions on the responsible officials in the fear that it could jeopardise future relations. Second, the war on drugs is not an area the UK government has paid much attention to recently. The last time the UK government discussed the war on drugs was in the context of human rights violations committed in the Philippines in 2019, nearly four years ago. Now, all of this is not to say that the prospect of UK human rights sanction is impossible in the, in the case of human rights violations committed as a part of the global war on drugs. Based on what we've seen so far, there are certain factors that can possibly increase the likelihood of UK Magnitsky sanctions, even in cases where there are strong countervailing considerations, such as strategic relationships or economic interests. First, Magnitsky sanction targets specific individuals and not the country as a whole. This gives UK flexibility to select specific individuals responsible for the abuses without necessarily implicating the leadership of the country in question. In practice, what this means is that where there are strong incentives not to jeopardise diplomatic or economic relations, the UK government is more likely to designate lower-ranking officials who committed the abuses, but are not the intellectual authors. For example, in the case of the murder of Khashoggi, the UK government designated 20 Saudi nationals involved in this murder, including mid-level mid intelligence officers and consulate staff, but crucially omitted Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, despite credible evidence regarding his responsibility for premeditating Khashoggi's murder. In the context of the global war on drugs, this may mean that the UK government is more likely to target individual police officers involved in abuses rather than government ministers creating the policies. It may also mean that it's easier, for example, in the Philippines, where there's been a government change and therefore allows the UK government to target ex-politicians rather than the current regime. Second, the UK government is more likely to take action against strategic allies where the US government has already imposed comparable sanctions and so provide a cover for the UK to follow suit. For example, the UK sanctioned against officers responsible for human rights abuses in Xinjiang in March 2021, followed after the US had already imposed such targeted sanctions in July 2020. As Simon mentioned earlier, in the case of Bangladesh, the, UK, the, sorry, the US has already imposed sanctions in 2021 against the Rapid Action, action Battalion, which had remarkable consequences with the number of extrajudicial killings significantly, significantly dropping in the three months following the imposition of sanctions. Yet, in this case, unfortunately, the UK has not followed suit and thereby created the risk of making the UK a safe haven for raw perpetrators and undermining the US's effort. 
Finally, both the case of Khashoggi and Xinjiang illustrate that the UK government is more likely to impose targeted sanctions where there is significant international pressure to take action, making it more costly for the government to stay silent than to name and shame their trading partners. In terms of the global war on drugs, there is currently a real momentum behind governments wanting to step up their efforts to protect human rights defenders and journalists, therefore framing abuses committed by government officials in pursuit of a global war on drugs policy along those lines could help capitalise on this momentum. Now, this leads me to our final point. Sanctions submission by civil society can actually, can actually help create this pressure and so form a crucial part of an advocacy campaign seeking accountability for human rights abuses committed in the name of the global war on drugs. Firstly, in requesting a sanction sanctions, civil society can raise the government's awareness of the abuses committed and demand them to take a specific course of action to address these violations. In making such a concrete demand, they will also have a stronger basis for asking the government to justify their failure to act or explain what alternative routes they propose. In this vein, a request for sanction can also be a catalyst for the UK government to raise abuses in other forms. For example, they can push the UK government to raise these abuses in the context of UN Human Rights Council session or increase pressure on the government to align trade negotiations with human rights commitments by making, for example, trade agreements contingent on improving the country's human rights situation. Now, to conclude my contribution, I want to stress that human rights sanction can be a key accountability tool for abuses committed in pursuance of global war on drug policies, but their potential is not only being realised when they have been imposed. Requests for sanctions provide a crucial advocacy tool to raise awareness and pressure governments into action. However, they are not a panacea, they are only one tool among several, including international litigation, diplomatic negotiations and policy advocacy. They are shipped together, form part of an integrated campaign to secure accountability for human rights abuses committed in the context of the global war on drugs. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Now, um, officially, we end in one minute. However, uh, I'm not aware of uh, another meeting in here, and I haven't seen anyone uh, come in uh, to suggest that we're uh, uh, asking questions or commenting. If you can, can raise your hand right now. Okay, and anyone online, uh, you can um, use the raise your hand function or turn your picture on and, and raise your hand. Okay, so uh, looks like uh, so far anyway we we just have a couple. So um, uh, back, back there, and if you're if you're willing, no, no requirement. You're uh, uh, let us know uh, uh, who you are. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David. Dave, for organizing this uh, side event. Uh, we're very grateful, especially because you also focused on the Philippine situation. And I'm very grateful to the Filipinos who are in here today who are very interested in the issue at hand. I would like to direct a question uh, to our dear Father Albert, Padding Bird, uh, because you had specifically addressed the Filipinos. And I assume it's the Filipinos not just here, the, but the Filipinos across the globe because this is being transmitted globally. And if we go back to the slide that you had on your appeal to the Filipinos, where you basically had uh, a slide that says, listen to the victims and authentic witnesses. As Filipinos living abroad, what would, you, what would be your practical suggestion, recommendation on how we can really do this? Uh, it's, it's easier said than done. For example, in Vienna, we have a very active Filipino community in, in various areas, civic, religious, mm -hmm. uh, interest groups. How do we come up with practical ways of transmitting this into action? Thank you, John. Not just the statistics, but stories about the, the victims. And check the, the news from Rapper, from BBC, from uh, Human Rights Watch. And since some of you are organized, maybe you can organize uh, a forum uh, using dedicating uh, the time for sharing information. 
or <laughs> and or <laughs> if you can invite some members of the families to the picnics so that you can listen, we can listen to their stories, mothers, wives. Get it first hand, not from us, not from the advocates, but from those who really get confused on what happened to their families. Okay? So that's, 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 it. that's important. And second, uh, when I say authentic witnesses, there have been witnesses. Those who confess that they were members of the double death squads, like Edgar Matubato, uh, Arturo Lascañas. Listen to their stories. They have, I, I stand here as a witness to their spiritual conversion. Not all of them, not all the, test, not all the uh, persons presented as uh, testimony, as uh, witnesses are okay. Sometimes we get faulted for that. But there are serious conversion stories, spiritual conversion stories. And their stories are precious, but uh, as an embarrassed prophets. So listen to them. I'm, I have named two, but there are other people. And finally, listen to Laila de Lima. Listen to Maria Reza. <laughs> they are not getting money from their risk, risky adventure. So, the, these stories are precious. Let's not waste lives by killing people and let's not waste truth by not listening to those uh, authentic witnesses. And I really appreciate how honest and sincere you were about the topic because of course, it's a very conflicting topic, and I think at the bottom line, we need to look on the underlying issues, whom are actually the supply and demand come from, and which communities have actually profited or gained or actually have a disadvantage, because we need to consider the health and safety also for the, the communities itself. Raising that, uh, there, there's a supply and demand. Those who were killed, are they in the supply side or demand side? Generally, the users or accused users. So that is in the the the, the supply, the, the demand side. Now, how many drug lords have we put in jail? How many of the doctoral dissertation, uh, MA researches, track the the real syndicates? No, we don't tax these things. Okay. So let's also address the supply side. And uh, Senator uh, Bato said, well, we know it, it comes from drugs that come from China. Why is it that in so many meetings, the, the, the flow of the drugs coming from China is not discussed? <laughs> now, drugs, during COVID time, that, there was an exposure expose on the family. My God, billions of pesos have been wasted and pocketed that were supposed to be spent on medicines and uh, masks and uh, protection. And it was exposed. And the masterminds were from other countries. Why is it that Malacanang itself played the role of lawyer lawyering for these masterminds of this unbelievable vampire uh, act of uh, corrupting money intended to protect the people from COVID. Let me say, you know, we are fighting death penalty, but extrajudicial killing is worse than death penalty. It is the same as death penalty because it means killing. But it is worse because you deprive the, the victims any semblance, any beginning, any first steps of uh, judicial approach. We 
please, let, let's find the right words to describe the situation so that we can find the right response. I'd add to that uh, that it's a lot easier and faster to do an extrajudicial killing uh, than uh, to have a trial and, uh, and uh, due process and then a few people on their death penalty. And the numbers certainly from the Philippines uh, show how much faster uh, uh, they are. Uh, so that's uh, one additional uh, problem with extrajudicial killing. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? Anyone online? Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, we have uh, one from online, uh, uh, Andrea. Uh, I think uh, I think you can unmute, but if uh... can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing. It is was an amazing session to listen to, very painful. I just would like some clarifications, uh, please. Um, you said something about spiritual and um, um, something to do with spiritual conversions, and I wasn't quite sure exactly what you meant in relation to what you were presenting about. I wonder if you could clarify, please. Thank you very much for the question. I mean, uh, those persons who confess privately and later on publicly that they were members of the death squad uh, who, okay. under the orders from above, killed uh, because uh, probably they initially they thought that was a good thing for society. That's a way of cleansing society. But then later on, when they themselves realized they were killing innocent uh, students, for example, accused of having drugs, but when they raided the houses, there were no drugs, but still they had to kill. So, and they are also haunted by the spirits of the people they killed, asking for justice, not just blaming them, but pleading, please do something, tell the story, so that we will not, this thing will not happen again. So there's spiritual conversion, and we can talk about this uh, in, a, in a different platform if you want. But uh, it's one thing to discuss the victims, those who were killed. It's another thing to discuss those who were part of the killing. In a sense, they are also victims. They, they said, we have become monsters. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Uh, Kenzie? Uh, thank you. I have to leave for the plenary. It's not really a question, just a comment. But I, uh, I'm not from Asia, but I find hard to realize how we can balance on the same scale the harm, the potential harm of drug that we know how to reduce this harm and they don't happen to everybody, even the most dangerous drugs, they don't kill 100% of their users. Whereas extrajudicial killing kills 100% of the people targeted. So the most powerful, the most dangerous, the most horrible drug is extrajudicial killing. And uh, putting the same thing on the balance is just unacceptable to me, and I think history will definitely prove it. Um, so thank you very much for organizing, for your words, and uh, all the best, and I hope sanctions can can come um, in a good, uh, uh, coordinated way, and I hope the international community will do everything to, to assist. And uh, thank you. Thank you. One, one of the things I mean, just, uh, you know, extrajudicial killing is not one thing. For example, if you take uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, it's an authoritarian regime is there for 14 plus years and then the extrajudicial killing and high number of enforced disappearances are also going on simultaneously, constantly. So that is ultimately the purpose is to create an entrenched fear in the society as a whole so that nobody 
raises <coughs> question and challenges the power about all these uh, insane actions that they are, they are committing, the crimes, it, it enforced disappearance is uh, uh, under the Roman statute, it's a crime against humanity, I mean, uh, so uh, these things should not go unseen and unaccounted. So the, it, one of the thing is that, that when we uh, uh, participate in this kind of discussion or convey the message to a larger audience, we feel sad, but at the same time, everyone has a role to play here. Human rights organizations or activists like us, we can document and we can bring it back to the international community. But the international community should also need to act it beyond their geopolitical interest, beyond their financial interest. That, and then human rights should be at the top of their list. Democracy, there is certain basic norms that we must not compromise. That whether there is, people have the very basic fundamental rights or not, and rights are protected or not, and people have access to justice or not. So these questions we need to ask, and then if, for example, if, if a government wants to buy five naval ships from one government and military hardware from another government, and then uh, they provide all support in the international voting mechanism for, electing to the CND or the GA or in the Human Rights Council, and that should not be the business. This, this business as usual, trade top priority, geopolitics top priority or second or uh, uh, highest priority, that should not be the position. As long as we maintain that, then we will see a worse war, not only the Ukraine war. There will be even more, even worse situation waiting for us uh, if we don't act right now. So that's why I would, I would request everybody to please do what, is, what role that you may have, whether either a government or an international human rights organization or media or whichever, I mean, side of the table you are sitting. Please do your job. We are ready to extend our help, our cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, additional questions or comments? Okay, well, thank yes. you. Oh, yes. Um, first of all, thank you for organizing. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, Natalie mentioned earlier that uh, we should uh, hold the people responsible for all the human rights violations. And, um, and there should be this call to action, right? And my question is, what, is, what if the voice is not too loud? Like in the Philippines, for example, the war on drugs, it had um, a very high approval rate during the time of the narrative. My worry is that the people will forget the 30,000 lives, the hundreds uh, of, of victims in, in Bangladesh, the Philippines, the UK, or uh, places around the world where the extrajudicial killings are happening. So what do we do to keep the conversation going? What do we do for people to, to care and not forget? Thank you. There's a study that the, the Philippines is the social media capital, texting capital of the world. Uh, maybe we spend three hours facing the cell phone. How much time we spent on educating ourselves on what is happening. So every, every person who has a cell phone has the capacity to get to know at least one victim. Is that impossible? Let there be a face and a name to the concept. And, you know, we know movie actors and actresses. We know what happens to their love lives. Can we at least know one, what happened to one family among the 30,000 victims? Isn't that? Because just one face and one name and one child and one voice would be enough to move the heart. And I call upon uh, everyone, you know, get to know at least one victim. Some policemen, they have their own stories of being forced, of being, having qualms. Get to know the real policemen. 
get to know the real family members. Get to know real persons. Not just rely on surfaces on cell phones because the cell phones have no side views. Unlike a human person, you can embrace. It's a three-dimensional thing. Get to get real. <laughs> so is that is that very demanding? I don't think so. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So thank you. Thank you. And let's educate ourselves. Okay. Thank you. I'll be very sharp. Is we don't have time, otherwise I will have explained it to you. Not to sell our principles for profit. It's very simple. And we need to act objectively. So regardless which country or which leader is there, if, if things are going wrong, so we must be with the truth. And then act objectively. So subjectivity destroys us. I mean, if uh, we, uh, if we, particularly in the case of this gross violation of human rights, it's not that uh, one peanut drop somewhere else and we did not look at it, picked it up and throw it to the bin, because it's a it's people's life and death question. Thirty thousand people died in the Philippines. Is I mean, killed extrajudicially. That's the con conservative figure. The real figure is even higher, I know. And in Bangladesh, the enforced disappearance and extrajudicial killings, the documented ones, you can't imagine how painful is the life of those people. The, the enforced disappearance victims, how those little children of, of, of the man who disappeared, every morning sits in front of the door and till the evening waits for the dad to come back and take her to the school. Uh, well, on the following day, it's heartbreaking. The extrajudicial mm -hmm. killings, victims, the how the widows, all the families of the mothers, how did they survive? The financial, the social, emotional, the, the, the trauma and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the heaps of problems. It, it, it all goes un uncounted. We, maybe in another, another event we will have chance to talk about that. But uh, what is important is that this arbitrary deprivation of life, all in the judicial way, whichever way this is happening, we need to use the instruments that are available in our hand so that it is stopped now. This is, this is an urgent call for everybody. So it, it, it may not be uh, uh, like if we are sitting in Europe and living here, it may not be in our home, the extrajudicial killing. But then some people got crazy and started a war. The, it happens through authoritarianism. All we need to understand the authoritarianism, the absence of accountability, and people's access to the justice mechanism. That's the core of all this. And gradually it becomes monster, like Vladimir Putin. Oh, Xi Jinping, I should not say it here. I live in Chinese territory in England. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so uh, what we need is that just do our our job sincerely. With uh, uh, I mean, sticking to the facts and not being biased to any regime for small or bigger interest. Any, uh, any, anyone else interested in? Uh, yes. Just a comment to your question. I mean, um, all these countries that we are listing who have, who are facing drug war, is they have no freedom of speech, freedom of press. So it's actually also Filipinos or Bangladesh that, like, outside from the country itself, that can't speak up. So why is it that only during election time people abroad actually speak up for the country? So actually we can still do that as well here. Um, and yeah, social media is a solution, but um, why wait for another election is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> that's, that's really a very good point. Is people try to use their freedom of expression staying in abroad. But there are consequences for that. The Bangladesh government uh, has trained a cyber army of its from the political party 
We are tens of thousands of people and we are paid from the official, I mean, exchequer. And uh, for each of the intervention that we take. So a lot of things, to be very brief, is that if it is Facebook or Twitter, <coughs> they uh, complain it, I mean, uh, report that, report, post. You understand, right? In Facebook, if you post any critical content about the government uh, regarding corruption or whatever, uh, abuse of power, so that particular individual or entity, the new media outlet, who uh, that are operated from, say, Europe or North America, so those entities or the individuals get their post reported by the cyber army trained by the authoritarian regime. That's what. So they struggle. People who know how to fight this out, they are able to manage it. And those who don't know, so they lose their entire social media account, for example. So this uh, business and human rights, the, uh, I mean, the accountability of the uh, co corporate companies, that's a larger issue needs to act there. The other thing is their larger family members. For example, a journalist uh, based in Sweden, publishes a news, uh, uh, online news portal uh, called Letter News, published corruption report of the ruling party, uh, and then the intelligence agency went to his home in Bangladesh, where his mom, uh, like 70 years old senior citizen, a retired person, lives, and in the midnight, the intelligence agency banged the door. She lives alone there. <coughs> There are somebody based in UK, a journalist, two of them, they published report on enforced disappearances and corruption in a media called uh, Weekly uh, Surma. The, it's a bi-weekly newspaper, bilingual newspaper. Uh, so then what happened? The two journalist brothers who live in Bangladesh, they were arrested and detained. So the, the consequences are also big. Somebody in the United States in exile, Again, uh, he published a leaked conversation of the army chief where he confirmed the prime minister's defense advisor gives the command to the national security intelligence to uh, disappear. And the somebody called uh, uh, a major general uh, uh, who controls the national telecommunications con uh, 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 NTMC monitoring cell. So that guy... Uh, he is also uh, part of the entire group who execute the enforced disappearances. So the army chief was telling his retired military officer friend, batchmate, in a conversation, and the person who was in the conversation, he on that show, on a, uh, on a talk show, confirmed that that was his voice and his conversation with the chief of army of that day. Then the journalist's sister, who has nothing to do with his brother's journalism. She got arrested in a narcotics case, again, the drug, illegal drug possession case and the cyber crime case, and detained for six months. <coughs> with, his, with her children. Children were later, uh, minor children. They, they were released later. So, I mean, being mindful to the time, I did not go into the cases, but as you raised. So, people are trying their best, I mean, I mean as much as they can, not everybody, but the capable people, but they are also facing consequences. It's not directly them, but their extended family members are paying the price. So that's why it's very necessary that if you have a credible election, then you have the people to decide that who should be their ruler. And on what condition, what kind of manifesto that they should accept or not. But when you have authoritarian system like this, with consecutive rigged elections, then you have no room, no place to go. And the problem become, becomes bigger and bigger. So it's a, it's a holistic approach that needed. When we do campaign, not only, at the, you, you are very right, not only before the election time, the struggle should continue every day, 365 days. And then we may, uh, and if it is do, uh, done relentlessly and very professionally, in a well-articulated well manner, then something may happen. For example, at least United States has been a bit responsive. 
that they use their Magnitsky human rights mechanism to uh, sanction few people. It's not enough, but it's a small beginning that, uh, that has given hope to people. So the other, other jurisdictions should also uh, be responsive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess I'll ask uh, probably just one more time any uh, remaining uh, comments or questions. Uh, no? Uh, uh, good. <laughs> uh, so thank you again for, for joining us. Um, glad to see some cameras here. If anyone is, is doing reporting, whether video or print, uh, we'd certainly appreciate if you uh, uh, can uh, send us uh, a link so we can uh, uh, read it and share it. Uh, lastly, uh, lastly, I um, I seem to have uh, neglected to include an uh, organization on the sign-in sheet. If uh, if you would like us to know uh, who you work with or anything more about us, feel free to write. I can be reached at ordinatedrcnet.org, the contact info in the email announcement if you have that, uh, or go to our website, stopthedrugwar.org, the contact form also uh, reaches me. Uh, thanks to our speakers for traveling from Rome and Hong Kong, long trip, and uh, again to our, our co-sponsoring organizations, and, uh, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much to joining that conference, and thank you from our guests. Thank you very much to all guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.